my god, you ruined it. You, ruined you made it me laugh. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Alec Mappa Hot Mess with Matthew Dipsy, psychotherapist. I'm Alec Mappa. I'm a hot mess. Welcome to the show. <laughs> and I'm Matthew Dempsey. I'm your psychotherapist. Oh my god, good thing it's all baked right into the title, right? It's kind of <laughs> like, if the show was just called Shit Show, then it would just be, I miss you, Matthew. I'm being vulnerable. I I'm, I'm admitting something. I feel like, you know, we've been doing this for nearly a year, which means I get to see you and talk to you every, every week and so if if i yeah. miss you for a week I'm, I'm wondering how you are i stalk you on the instagram and you posted something <laughs> publicly yesterday that you were feeling a little insecure oh i did i didn't realize we were gonna just dive into that but yeah it's I, public you, know, you put it out there what are you feeling insecure about <laughs> that's true you know honestly i've just i've just been noticing within myself just kind of like a little uneasiness just kind of feeling hmm. like a little insecure do you ever have that where you just kind of feel like a little insecure, but there's not like every a goddamn thing. day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not like a specific thing that, you know, you're just like, uh, I don't know, I'm not making enough money or, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'm struggling in my relationships. It's not those things on the surface. Everything more or less is kind of OK. But then there's. Yeah. And you did qualify that in your post. You were like, I'm doing really yeah. well from the outside, but there's an inner struggle happening. Yeah, but there's an inner struggle happening. And and mostly when, when I'm taking stock of things in my life and everything seems okay and I'm kind of feeling mm -hmm. bad, especially during a time like right now, I chalk it up to just kind of like, well, this is just some COVID shit, right? We're still like, in a, right. we're still in a time of a pandemic where there's a lot of uncertainties and insecurities globally. So we can, we can feel that. And so the main thing that I wanted to do is I just wanted to share that because I've been hearing that from a lot of people, my friends, like almost every single one of my clients, but there's mm -hmm. not really a whole lot of like public discourse about it. So I just kind of mm. wanted to just try to chime in and kind of add a bit of that flavor to the conversation. And the really interesting thing is I've been noticing how many people have been reaching out like with great concern and it's, it's, incre it's incredibly sweet. And I'm so like, I am right now comfort. Well, sure. I mean, but you're just kind of checking in. But like, like some people have had real concern, like have been texting me if, you know, I know them personally, been texting me, making sure that I'm okay. And I'm Good. like, I'm, I'm okay, right? I'm okay. And I am also feeling a little insecure. So I just wanted to let that be known that you, both things can be true at the same time. Of course. And you know what's missing when you say this is a COVID thing is like what's missing is our friendships are very validating, to be around friends who enjoy our company and to be social with people and kind of like, you know, have your social face on or, or do you know what I mean? To be, to be among friends and, and to laugh and to, that's, that's extremely validating. And to go without that is, yeah you know. That's a big, it's, it's, it's uh, really challenging for us because we are social creatures by nature. So when that mm -hmm. part of a basic human need is removed yeah. significantly, we feel more insecure because it's just kind of like tribe mentality. It's a survival mechanism, you know, strength in numbers. So when we don't have access to that kind of connection, we feel like an, an angst, even though rationally and intellectually, we know that we'll be okay and can survive on a deeper level, we can feel some of that insecurity. And both of those mm. things can be true at the same time. You can feel a little insecure and also know that you're okay. That duality. Duality, yes, two truths, two truths. Yeah. Speaking of strength in numbers, um, ours are increasing every single week. We have listeners joining the, the Hot oh, Mess podcast because we we're talking that. about mental health and vulnerability every week. Um, yes. If you're a first-time listener, welcome to the show. Don't forget to download and subscribe. We love having you here. Um, yes. My insecurities lately have just been about um, – it's just really shallow stuff. I gained a lot of weight during, um, I gained at least 15 pounds during the pandemic. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and I'm working out really hard, but um, mm -hmm. I'm not really changing my diet. <laughs> yeah. So there's muscle on top of fat. It's kind of like, but it's kind of, <laughs> do you know what? I'm 55 and I look at my body now and I'm like, that's pretty good. That's, yeah. you know, I'm not, I'm not, because I think for the last 10 years, I was emaciated when I was in my 20s. I could wear anything. I could eat anything I want. And I think for the last 10 years, I've been beating myself up for not looking like that, for not being 110 pounds. And now it's yeah. kind of like, I'm good. We're good. Yeah. But every once in a while, yeah, I'm looking yeah. at it. I think it's the Instagram thing. <gasps> Did I tell you? I joined oh, TikTok. Sure. 
I joined You're on TikTok, TikTok for a you week. Making TikTok videos? No, I'm, I oh, wasn't making. Man. I was curious because I wanted to see. I was on it for a week. I was on it a lot, and I was watching just yeah. nothing but hot guys. And it was, and then it was like it turned out because we have the time because I had the time. It was turning into like forty five minutes to an hour every day, and I was like, I took it off my phone because I was like, this is not how I want to spend my life. Yes. Well, Are you it's on it? also less. I am on TikTok. I haven't made any videos quite yet, but I think I want to. But I really love the videos. And honestly, TikTok videos and memes and GIFs are the only things that have really been getting me through the last year because they're just so fun. I don't follow the, I don't follow the guys who are just kind of like there to look pretty and be hot. But I follow so many of the other people who are just so creative, so funny, just like the best, the best videos. And I saw somewhere recently, somebody had posted like, uh, is anybody else's new love language of the last year sending 30 TikToks to somebody at three in the morning? And I'm like, that's fucking me. I'm just sending TikToks to everybody. (laughs) Just like all the dumbest videos. And people are like, can you please stop messaging me? You're, you're a better person than I am. Cause I was just there for the hot. (laughs) I was following hashtags like tall TikTok, gay TikTok. TikTok yeah, yeah, yeah. hottie, whatever. I just wanted to see, but I made wow. all kinds of discoveries. Yeah. I mean, just like, wow, oh, there's I'm no sure. shortage of hot well, guys you know out what? there. There's there's no shortage of hot guys, but if you can tap into the right videos and then you send that as your new love language to people, then that's maybe how you can connect in some healthy ways as opposed um, to toxic relationships. <laughs> yes, which is our theme for today. That was my that's yeah, me fumbling our my way through introducing the theme for today. <laughs> the most <laughs> awkward segue. Toxic relationships. Here we are. I I I thought that was seamless. It was like silk off a spool. You were just oh, like Thank you. Thank it you. It was it was it was it was so nuanced. It was barely a whisper. Yeah. Um All right, toxic, toxic relationships, Alec, go. Go. Um, uh, you know, our <laughs> guest today is Priyanka, who's fabulous. I've been hosting the RuPaul's Drag Race official podcast with her. She's an amazing, talented performer. She's winner of Canada's Drag Race. She's queen yeah. of the Great White North. And uh, yep. we, I just get, I'm having a blast just getting to know her and everything. And it's no, um, she's, she loves talking about relationships. But um, when it comes to toxic relationships, <laughs> the most toxic relationship I've ever had, Matthew Dempsey, has been with yes. myself. Yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> that's what I got out of therapy. Say more, I, Alec. Say more. No, what? Well, what? Well, listen. When I got out, when I that's what I got out of therapy. The first uh, ten years of therapy, or the first five years of therapy, it was like, it was not just that I had tox met going out with toxic guys. It's that I gave toxic yeah. guys my phone number. It's like yeah. uh, everything that they had in common was me. And um, my therapist said, I said, uh, my question was, why, why am I always in this situation? And he said flat out, you're addicted to it. Mm-hmm. That this so is an addiction wait, of I'm yours. Curious. You're used to feeling this way. Yeah. So let me ask you, though, because I'm kind of curious about it. It's You obviously get to a point where you realize that the relationships that you're attracting say more about you and the relationship you have with yourself. But like just on the surface, what were you noticing? Like what were the kinds of toxic relationships that you were that you were finding yourself in? I was never anybody's priority. I was never I was always in it more than the other person, which meant I was choosing people who were not on the same level as me because that's what love that's. Yeah, who weren't available because that's how I was taught love feels like. I grew up with a dad who, you know, if I was on fire, he'd go, do you guys smell something? Anyway, so, uh, you know, just like (laughs) it was. So I was that was that was how I learned love from men. And so the pattern up until my late 20s, I mean, it just it, it couldn't become more plain, more toxic it was like, yeah. but you know, it, it, it's when you're like me and you learn things the hard way. Yeah. And it, all of a sudden your life comes up and you're looking at it objectively. When I went yeah. into Sex and Love uh, uh, um, Addicts Anonymous and I heard other people talking about toxic relationships, I saw myself so clearly yeah. in other people. And I was like, mm-hmm. well, you know, the problem is somebody said to me once in one of those sessions, you keep talking about the other person, the other person, the other person, the, what he's doing, what she's doing, what they're doing. Let's take them out of the equation for one second. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and what does – and answer the question. Take, take accountability. What does it say about you that you're continuing yeah. to stay with this person? 
Yeah, when you're noticing that all of the conversations you're having and all the relationships that you're talking about, all those guys are the constants. Uh, or sorry, those are the variables. You're the constant, right? So right, getting to right. reflect on that. It's like, okay, how, how have I helped to create this pattern over and over and over again? And it gives us a chance to reflect. Like the way you were talking about some of the earliest relationships and how that kind of shapes you know, the types of relationships that we're drawn to later on, you know, uh, for me, even there was, um, like, I grew up where there were certain people in my family that I had to kind of like walk on eggshells with or cater to and all that kind of stuff. So I have found myself in relationships with people who have also kind of been, you know, like, I've had to walk on eggshells, or I had to be like, sure. extra cautious, or I had to take care of. But the thing that's important, I think, for um, for all of us to realize, it's not that we're like doing this to ourselves, or you know, we hate ourselves and always have to learn the hard way. You know, and other people can figure it out easier. It's that we find opportunities in life later on where we get to actually have some of those same dynamics. We're drawn to those people because it's a chance for us to then become more kind of woke to that. And then start mm-hmm. doing things consciously so we can heal the wounds that we've had. But we can't ever do that if we're trying to change other people. All we can ever do is heal ourselves and, you know, and then have the people that we're attracted to start. To I'm heal. glad you said heal the wounds because what it did was the accountability gave me space to forgive everybody. And it, it gave me space to yeah. forgive myself. It was kind of like That's I right. went through so much of like really beating myself up for all the choices I've made. Oh, the other quote I heard is, um, if you total three cars in a row, it's hard to blame the other drivers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, toxic relationships check out your can driving. feel like several car crashes. <laughs> yeah, maybe you should check. Maybe you're not a good driver. Um, no, it was really kind of like um, I didn't think that my love was as, as important as somebody, as somebody else's. I did. Your love yeah. was always more important than mine. And it was all about, um, you know, as a sex and love addict, it was, I'm using somebody else, I'm using this relationship or this sexual situation in order to fill my own deficit. Yes, which is not I'm coming from a place of deficit. Well, you're coming from a place of deficit, and then because of that, the way that you're approaching a relationship is through a barter system. You're saying, I'm yes. going to do this, or I'll chase you this much so that you'll then give me attention and make me feel necessary. And that's not what a relationship should be because it should be with love, and love is a gift, right? We make sure that we're taken care of, we heal our wounds, we're practicing self care so our cup then is full and runneth over, and then we can give whatever access that we have to give. And that's your approach. <laughs> Speaking of wounds and gifts and cups, um, <laughs> I was trying to uh, trying to come up with a terrible segue. Uh, we have a great guest today. Uh, we have Priyanka, uh, a drag queen extraordinaire and winner of RuPaul's Drag Race, and we're going to talk to her as soon as we come back. Today's guest is the winner of Canada's Drag Race, and in her words, the most boy crazy person you've ever met. I've been having a total blast hosting the official RuPaul's Drag Race podcast with her, which you should totally check out. If you haven't yet, please welcome my dear friend, the Queen of the North, Priyanka. Yay! Wow, wow, yay! yay. How was that for an intro? I'm so happy. I love that intro. I'm so happy to add to this hot mess. You look very butch today with your your stubble. You're you're a hairy beast. I don't have to be in drag until tomorrow so i've been just growing it out every orifice has all been right. growing it out every <laughs> orifice all right here Perfect, you go this yeah. is our opportunity this this um this podcast is all about getting real talking about the real stuff and uh you want to so talk about toxic relationships go <laughs> oh, I love talk. I I love toxic relationships. Yay! I honestly, it's so funny. I um have built this like persona on commenting about toxic relationships. Like I won best Twitter comedy award at the Wowies um, in December, mm-hmm. and it was all because I would just talk about my exes all the time online. Now I have a, a very interesting past when it comes to relationships. My first ever relationship was a man that I met from Australia, and he told me he was going uh, home for Christmas, and he never came back, and never heard from him again. And then the second mm-hmm. guy I was dating was oh, no. named Chase, and uh, he um, it was not good. It got weird. It was very uh, uh, the, there was a little bit of a physical altercation at one time. So there's that guy. Oh, the third no. guy, um, 
then the third guy, I, I met him. He had a boyfriend at, at, at the time, and then we ended up dating for a bit. And then I just fell out of love with him, and that was a, another toxic feeling because I was like, how can you love somebody so much? And all of a sudden, the next day, you wake up, and you're like, never mind, just kidding. <laughs> and then the other guy, after him, he was also dating somebody when I met him. And then I never trusted him, always thought he was cheating on, on me. And then the last guy that I was dating, I was dating throughout the season of Candace Drag Race, and then he dumped me right after the finale. So let me tell you. <sighs> something if you're looking for an expert of toxic relationships i'm your girl <laughs> all right well, all right we matthew were talking about yes okay well we were just talking about how there's you know a lot of times when we like look at the relationships we're trying to dissect why each one doesn't work and what's wrong with the person but also trying to see if there's like a through line right like what's the commonality and maybe what's our, our part in that so for you what, it, what have you been able to uncover or notice about you know, patterns in your relationship? Oh, it's all to do with self-worth. You know, we date these. I'm saying we as in me. So I would date yeah. these guys. And it's mm-hmm. almost like you can't believe someone actually chose you to date because I, you're so low on your self-worth. <gasps> so whenever these guys are doing shit, shitty things to you, you're all, you're all like, oh, but like how could this happen? Like, he likes me. I never have guys that like me. And and, yeah. and that's what would help me tolerate all the stuff that I was going through. So that would be the through line. It was all self-confidence because what were the, I, I what would were always the shitty like... What were the things, though? What were the, what were the commonalities? Were, were there similarities from person to person? Yeah, was, was there, was there a through line you? of shitty that they all had in common? I mean, the through line that I <laughs> always you know, tended to go through with these motherfuckers would be that um, um, it, it would be very like I was always the crossover, like always like I was always the light at the end of the tunnel. So they would be in something a little dicey. And then oh. I would be the, oh, but like I could have this relationship with this person. He has such great energy, great personality, you know, uh, all that stuff. And then they would end mm. up dating me, but then it would just all fall because I would be like a rebound, say. Uh, so yeah, you're right. I've I've never been at the end of the tunnel. I've never been the light at the end of the tunnel. I've just been a tunnel. <laughs> oh. I've just been a fucking the, tunnel. <laughs> That's just it. Just a tunnel. Darkness. But you know what? When you said when you said how could you fall out of love with somebody, I, that kind of stood out to me because as a sex and love addict, um, uh, which um, I didn't know if you knew that about me, uh, recovering sex and love addict, I would have sex with people, and in the middle of it, like somebody I got home went home with and was like nuts. God, this person is so hot, and then they would do something or say something or make a certain face, and I'd be like, ugh. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and oh, I would yeah. just drop there, yeah. out completely, and I'd be like repulsed, and I'd be like, "How did that happen?" Just happen. kind of like I know it's yeah, yeah, it's crazy when like you think that because because I think for me, especially being a person of color and like mm. being someone that's not usually desired by the masses. Um, whenever I'm like attracted to somebody, it's like I'm so attracted to them because like oh they must like me and like this doesn't happen that often and blah 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 blah. But then, in the turn of a switch, there was one guy who I met re- uh, not recently, maybe like October, and like he came to a show and he was like so into me. And then you know everyone around me was like oh my god Priyanka, like the way he looks at you, the way he does this, the way he does that. But then it just like that became the turn off. It was like it, it was because weird he liked you. That it's because he liked me, and I was like, "Oh, this is not this is not fun." What? Someone actually. So it's a very yeah. It, it's a very interesting thing. Hold on, my second, dogs, please. Tell your dogs yeah. to shut up. Genesis. Someone <laughs> muzzle the dogs. These dogs. Every this. I don't okay. understand. Like, train your dogs. Train them. Shut up! You know what you're talking about. You don't know. You haven't known real this love. Is, uh, you thought. Don't don't, don't no, hate I'm on actually, my dogs. You thought. You thought that we were here to record a podcast about toxic relationships about me. It's actually your toxic relationships with your friggin' dogs. With your you can dogs. Never shut them up. Okay. All right. Listen to me, because there's something something about you stood out to me. Um, I'm also a gay man of color, and um, mm-hmm. I this is what I'm exploring. Uh, there's two things. One, being repulsed by somebody who likes you. Because I felt that before. Yeah. Of like, all through college, if somebody liked me, it was like, you're a weirdo. That's not what love feels like to me. Uh, uh, what love felt like to me was like a hot guy who would fuck me and then return my calls every three weeks. 
right? That was like Every, hot. Three, three to but, four, three but, to four, three to four weeks. Yes. But then somebody told me that, oh, this was in that um, somebody who's vulnerable with you and somebody who really likes you, that's the riskier relationship. Yes. That's the more dangerous relationship. And when somebody said that to me, I was like, and I was like, and I, I, I got it because it's like in those relationships, you really have to show up with, with yeah. and be vulnerable and be open to being loved. And I never got that before. The other thing that you said was as a person of color. Now, as I'm getting older, I'm old. Um, I'm wondering how much of that is us and how much of that is the world. Because as as gay men of color, I, I grow up. You, we you see. You know, all the images in the magazines look like Matthew. Everybody looks like Matthew. I'm supposed to look like Matthew, and if I don't look like Matthew, I'm ugly. Now that's how mm-hmm. I conditioned myself. But then I realized that um, there's a little bit of both. That I, when I started changing my perception of myself, I I recognized more and more people were interested in me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So my question to you is how much of that is you and how much of that is the world? For me, it was opposite. Like, I didn't realize that there was this big, like, racism within the gay community issue until I started doing drag. Like, before, I would go out to the clubs, pick up some Hawkeye in the back room, take him home, and that would be it. And the heartbreak would be the heartbreak. I never thought of it because of my skin color. It wasn't until I started drag and I would be on stage looking out into the audience and watching all these different storylines come to life. I, I, I would see the black guy go up to the white guy and the white guy say, sorry, not into black guys. I would see the brown guy approach a white guy and the white guy be like, mm, no, thank you. So I was watching it from a bird's wow. eye view being like, oh, oh I never I've thought been of that this way before, but I never thought it was racism because my mama raised me to be like, well, no matter what skin color you are, you walk into the room and you are just as equal as everybody else. So I never wanted to use racism as an excuse or I never wanted to victimize my, my, myself because of my skin color. But it wasn't until I was on stage watching it go down in the clubs that I was like, yeah. oh, my God, it's happening. It's happening. And this is bad. I don't want this to happen because I don't want it to be this way. But it, it, it's happening. So I think partially it's like. Yes, of, of course, like once you see it, it's hard to unsee, but it's a real thing that we can't ignore. And like, I've mm. also been with people, and I'm sure you have too, Alec, that like, oh, I'm only into brown guys. No, bitch, you're fetishizing my skin color. You're not into, yeah. you're not into me because of my soul. You're in, into me because of my skin color. Like, oh, you have a fetish to have sex with, 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 with a, an Indian guy? That's like, that's not love. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, no, I could it, clock it, that a mile it, away. It's, it's like, thing, I could be anybody. A, that's not sexy yeah. to me. No, so it, it's a thing that that's happening, and it's a thing that like as a POC we g- kind of sometimes give into, and then that's what can create a toxic relationship. Because like with my um, ex, uh, my two exes ago, he said something one, one time. He was like, "Well, my last boyfriend was white, and now you're brown." And I was like, "Why is it a skin color thing?" Mm-hmm. So why, why did it, like, why was it even brought up? Exactly, like it shouldn't matter, yeah. but it, yeah. it makes you think, and, and it's 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 a scary, slippery slope because the last thing you want is to be so deep in this relationship with somebody who you're really into, and then have them end up being a racist. Right. Yeah, Alec. I think what you were saying earlier is is also kind of like the important part of it too, which is like there are two truths. Like we, racism is a real thing. We exist within a racist society and culture. And also that is going to impact any non-white person, you know, in a way mm-hmm. that it can be to a certain extent internalized. And so then it becomes kind of like the task to be able to call that out kind of, you know, within any person of color to be able to, to check in on that stuff and how much that can fuck with, you know, thinking about self-worth and value and how we move through the world and those kinds of things. And also still recognize that it exists and it's something that needs to be, you know, uh, yes, and, and it's those two early. things that can be going on at the same time. But it's kind of like, OK, so when I was six, six, 16, 17 years old, I went on a trip to the Philippines. We used to go every couple of years to visit my relatives. And this was my first trip as an adult. I wasn't a kid anymore. I was a you know teenager. And I remember driving home from the, driving to my aunt's house from the airport, every billboard had somebody that looked like me. Every movie poster had somebody that looked like me. And then it occurred to me, oh my God, two things. This is what it must be like to be white. Mm-hmm. And mm. to, to see yourself. And then the second thing was like, oh my God, I am gorgeous. 
<laughs> it was like I never, I never thought of myself in those terms before as the toothpaste guy or the boyfriend. Right. It was just like that was a major step for me in altering my perception of myself because you know there's when you Matthew is really great at making me recognize that two things can be going on at the same time. Because I grew up in San Francisco. I did grow up around a lot of people that look like me. But the pervasive media did not represent that, did not mirror that back to me. But my day-to-day life, getting on the bus, going to school, blah, 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 I saw people who look like me all the time. And it wasn't until I moved to New York where I feel that people were more economically segregated and more racially segregated than they were in San Francisco, just because San Francisco is a postage stamp of a city. It's seven miles by seven miles. You can't walk two feet without bumping into somebody. Uh, that it was pointed out to me that I was uh, I was othered more when I moved away, when I moved out of SF. Yeah, it's so interesting. Like I wasn't othered until I started drag and realized what my message was. Did you grow and up in Toronto? Skin color... I grew up in Whitby, Ontario, which is 45 minutes outside of Toronto, around white, mm-hmm. white people. Everyone was white. And I remember my mom just told this story. She said that one day I came home because my neighbor said I was brown. And I, it was, I was like four years old. And, and, I, and I ran and I was like sobbing, like couldn't catch my breath. Like, <laughs> you know, like, mm-hmm. Jesse called me brown. And she was like, well, like, look at your skin color. You're brown. I had this like aha <laughs> moment to be like, oh, my God, I am brown. And it, it is one of those things where like these like racist things are, are things that are put on to us from our parents. Like my mom was like, you're brown celebrated who, who cares? And that's something that always stuck with me. Um, yeah. But it, 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 it does dive into now growing up, coming out of the closet, finding yourself in your career, feeling a diff, you know, feeling the way that people look at you because your skin color that then end up, you know, being toxic in your relationships because like with these white men who I've dated, it's almost like they were doing me a favor by dating me, which then created Mm. a toxic energy, which then, which then made me, you know, I, I I always say that like you could be with anyone, but there's something about being with specific people that can make you so toxic. I have started arguments. I have screamed. I have cried. I have started ar- arguments for no reason. I've done it all. But that's not who I am. That's not like that's mm-hmm. not who I think I am. But because of my self worth and because of their yes. past, how we met, and the foundation that we built the relationship on, yeah. that's what caused all of that fighting. Like the fighting. Oh my! There was totally, one time where yeah. I went to the bar. And and uh, with him, with with the, my not this last relationship, another one, and um, he bought a girl a shot, like a girl, like his friend, uh-huh. and because. I just did not trust him and I did not feel like he was treating me right ever. Him not yeah. buying me a shot turned into like a 24 hour betrayal. Fight. I like, yeah. Oh my goodness. Betrayal. How could you? Where's my, you know, you don't <laughs> yes. care about me all these. And I was like, and now looking back, I'm like, what the hell bitch? Like just go buy yourself a shot. You know, Treat I know, but you just but said it. it. You like, just said it. The core of it to me is the red flag for yes, me is you don't like the, care the, about the foundation. Me. Yeah, you don't care exactly. about me. That was kind of like, that was just like the match being lit is like seeing the attention paid mm-hmm. to somebody else is enough to like, you know, it was trigger you. Yeah, exactly. And one thing that I do want to talk about on this a podcast is my most recent boyfriend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Hit it. So, All right, that's a I happy face. About plenty. Um, is he the one in so was he the one in your being, TikTok so, videos on the couch? Was he the one on the laid out on the couch in the okay, TikTok wait, videos? Okay, so so wait, wait, wait. Okay, so wait. Okay, wait, hold on, hang on, hang on. So, so the, so there's two things I want to talk about. So there's there's so there's that guy, he's the best, but there's a guy before him. So I was dating somebody throughout the season of Canada's drag race. And I promised myself that I would not date anybody throughout the season because it's all about me and I want this to be all about me and then you meet this guy Mm -hmm. and then he's the Mm -hmm. best and 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 you never thought you're gonna meet somebody and he was at the finale of like of canada's drag race at the phoenix concert theater in toronto and he was so drunk and he was like flaunting himself all over the place and he wasn't paying attention to the finale he was such an embarrassment and then right after the finale like a month fish later he dumped me right after my uncle died and I did have this moment where I sat there with it with myself and was like, why do I attract this type of person? 
so the question is so before so now I'm with a great guy and everything's great but before this <laughs> my question to you both of you is like how do you break that pattern and how do you like let yourself go because now with this new guy like he's talking about shit in the future and like that scares the shit out of me because future doesn't exist in my past relationships mm-hmm. they did as yeah. it's not a thing yeah so how do you let go okay, I'll, uh, so I'll go, go Matthew I'll say that in in kind of like my experience and all the kind of professional work that I've done I could probably say that the the two greatest um, things that stand out as, as kind of variables in this is one, the earliest relationships that we have. So checking in with yourself, like really kind of doing that deep dive. It's so cliche therapy shit, but really doing a deep yep. dive and checking in on what are those earliest relationships with parents or family members mm. and what kind of patterns have I noticed in the kind of guys that I'm into or relationships that I've had that also maybe mirror some of the earliest relationships and what kind of childhood mm-hmm. trauma am I trying to to address, but using all the same bullshit tools that I've ever used that have never gotten me anywhere. Right, so that's right. one, checking in on that part. And the second part is also checking in on the cultural sh- uh, stuff that we've been talking about. So obviously, you know, growing up as a marginalized person, oppressed because of race, ethnicity, things like right. that. Also growing up as a gay person. You know, what are, the, what are the marginalized experiences that we've had that shape a very negative and irrational belief about ourselves and how much mm. does that play out in the kinds of relationships where we're chasing after approval and acceptance from people um, that we value and think, you know, that we need that uh, attention from. So checking in okay. on those two things first, noticing your own patterns, and then being able to start working through that consciously. And that takes so vigilance, you know, and, and sometimes... Okay. Sometimes for okay, it's my turn. Hear me out. Sometimes it's it's what? Okay. What? What? I just Go. want Alex shut up. What I want to know is this. You is shut like, up. What so we're talking about talk we're talk you shut up and spank me. You baby. shut up. So we're talking about talks You guys have a toxic me, relationship. Spit on me. Um I just I want to know like what is the account so when when you're when we're saying the word toxic like we often villainize the person that we were dating like all my exes are the worst people in in, in the world so what is the accountability that we have to put on these people or does it matter yes well that's a good question first well first of all when we're talking about a toxic relationship we're talking about the relationship, the dynamic. We're not assassinating another person's character, whether it be somebody else's or our own. You know, like you said earlier, this is not who I am, but sometimes I just get my shit stirred up. Yeah, because that's not who you are, that's what you do, right? And so it's about the kind of conflict of what each person is doing when they're in a very vulnerable and intimate kind of relationship. So making sure that um, you're kind of checking on that stuff first, how you frame it. Um, I think the accountability piece for somebody who's been in a marriage for 19 years, I mean, where we are with with our stuff is like we have to own it. But we've made the investment and the commitment to be together. So that's maintenance. However, until you're in a relationship that's long term, uh, the accountability piece for me was really about myself. And that took vigilance. Like just just watching my words, watching my expectations. I, you know, when I was starting to get better, it was very telling. I had a boyfriend and I said to him, you know, you shouldn't be so nice to me. I'm not used to it. Like I said that. And he said, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. I'm your boyfriend. I want to be nice to you. And Alec, if you're in a relationship with somebody and you love each other, they should be nice to you. You should be. And so what I was learning for, for my part in my words and in my actions, what I had to learn was how, what I was taught that love felt like, this is what love feels like to me, was really destructive and toxic. And I had to relearn what kindness to myself felt like and accepting kindness and accepting graciousness and accepting um, affection for another person because I learned that I didn't know how to do that. I could be physical with somebody. I had no problem doing that. But it was very hard for me to be, like you said, vulnerable. When somebody said, the, um, the person who shows up for you is the dangerous relationship. Because that calls on you to kind of show up and be vulnerable as well. Yeah, that's what you've said, Alex. So uh, shut up. Many times before about, <laughs> about the relationship. You know, you kind of like, Shut up. 
that part. <laughs> You've attributed so much shit to the relationship that you had with your dad, right? Where you always felt like he wasn't validating, he wasn't attentive. Whenever he actually was even participating at all, it was just to criticize. So you were mostly just kind of chasing after his affection for so long. Mm -hmm. So it's not just mm -hmm. maybe such a surprise that for, you know, in your adult life then, you keep chasing after people and you are only interested and attracted to the people who aren't going to be there or who will just criticize you and not be nice to you because of the fact that that is just a familiar dynamic. And as human yes. beings, we don't like change. We follow and grasp after what feels familiar because it's comfortable. Right. When my therapist told me it was an addiction, I was like, what are you talking about? He said, you're used to the chase. You're used to that. That That's your high. That is where your adrenaline, that's erotic to you, is the chase. That's what's sexy. And then all of a sudden I was realizing, it, when I looked at it objectively, having to chase after somebody to make them like you is gross. It's just kind of like, ew, like I don't want to be that person anymore. And I was that person for so long. Right. But, you know, but like the chase is what felt familiar. The chase is what, that yeah. was my default position. Wait, I just want to jump in real quick. I just want to say a couple of things for people who may, who might not totally identify with all of this because, all right. you know, for a lot of people, it very much is kind of, you know, an addiction and something that needs to be treated in that specific way. There's a lot of people also that it might not necessarily need to be even defined as an addiction if we're just no. really hyper-focused on the patterns of dysfunction that continue to exist. So noticing that and also being careful to be kind to ourselves, <laughs> Alec, maybe not to call it gross and beat ourselves up and shame ourselves <laughs> for it, but to gross. be able to call it out as something that is kind of off the path of love and being able to then gently, you know, kind of redirect and experiment with some new, right. maybe more uncomfortable ways of approaching relationships. For the record, just the only thing I have to add to that is I had to identify my problems as an addiction because I couldn't yes. stop seeing I was in a toxic relationship that I would I refused to leave. That I knew that I knew cognitively yeah. and objectively it was a bad relationship and I stayed in it anyway. And that when when I knew that, that's when I had to identify it as an addiction in order to get better in order to move on. Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. And it's not what's my name, don't worry. Is um <laughs> is there any kind of toxic behavior that's this is gonna sound so messed up, but like is there any kind of toxic behavior that is healthy behavior as well? Like say I wanted to post a photo to get some guy's attention or or, or say I wanted to like or thirst trap about an about an ex. Yeah, say I want to pers uh, post a thirst trap or say I want to subtweet about an ex that made for good content o online. Like, are those things okay? Because I've had an ex yeah. come Alec, up to me and be like, think? were you subtweeting about me? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alec, what are your well, thoughts? Whatever. I'm curious. I want to hear your thoughts first. Uh, okay. Well, I would, I would probably liken it to, you know, really kind of like break it down in basic terms. Um... We're always going to do some shit that's not just about kind of pure love and health. You know, look, we're not going to be Mother Teresa ever. We're always going to no. do some shit that's just very human and ego driven. Um, it's more about how can we have the majority of our decision making and motivation in life come from a place of strength building and growth and healthy living. And then also like, you know, kind of less of the less of the stuff. It's kind of like, all right, you want to you want to make sure that you're eating healthy, you know, maybe five days out of the week and then you eat some shit a couple days of the week. Right. Mm, yeah, right. It's just finding the right balance on it. And being you think it's conscious. kind of like if you're going to do it, at least be conscious of it. Just own it. You're saying own yeah. it. Yeah, I think – yeah, it sounds like it. Because, like, for – like, I, like, you know, love talking about my my exes online because, like – and I'm not, like, bashing their names. Like, I'm not saying, like, and one time, this, you know, I guess I kind of bash them on this podcast. Uh -huh. But, you know, it does create – like, I, as an art, an artist and as, you know, a drag queen that's been on this reality TV show where, where fans know me – out of drag I'm not like a Beyonce where they know mm -hmm. nothing about my personal life like they know everything about me they know about my coming out story they've watched me on these 10 episodes on Canada's Drag Race plus they all follow me now so there is that like my fandom needs that relatability to kind of stay in tune with me so it's like sometimes mm -hmm. although it might be a little toxic -y, it does give my, my fans that like like that look into my life which I don't mind giving them because we all go through shit we're all mad at our exes sometimes we're all you yeah. know be betrayed sometimes so I, I i i tend to play into that you know kind of very very like taylor swift of drag vibes 
Mm-hmm. Where do you draw the line? Have, when 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 is stuff what's personal? Like if you're like, yeah, I'm not going to post about that. Do you have anything? Do you have a I line think, in your head? A boundary. I think now now that I'm in something healthier, like. I just don't even really talk about it because it's Okay, you, it sounds like, like you're a little more about, protective of that. Yeah, it seems like now it's like... Because also when I was dating this guy during the season of Canada's Drag Race, I, I, I like I go... You know when you can watch yourself have conversations with people mm-hmm. and you watch yes. yourself like... You wa- you're watching yourself lie, lie to yourself and it's embarrassing because <laughs> there's so many conversations that I had with, with people that were like, yeah, but he's a great guy. Like, I love him. Like, we're going to last so long. Like, I have a feeling like he's my next boyfriend for sure. And all my friends are like, yeah, hun, cool. Like, good luck. And they, you know, your friends see it. They're, your friends see it before yeah. you see it. Mm. And um, it, it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, it's like you, you, you talk yourself into these toxic relationships uh-huh. because – you want your friends to justify and tell you that you're doing the right thing because that reassurance means like, okay, I'm not crazy. This is normal. No, I I was surrounded by friends who kept it real to the point where I couldn't talk to them. (laughs) They would be like, (laughs) don't talk to me about him. We have the same conversation over and over again. So now as you're making the transition into a healthy relationship, what do you feel like is the biggest difference in you? That's a great question, Alec. Thank you so mm-hmm. much. Um, You're welcome. I, I would say <laughs> she's my she's my granddaughter. Obs- Priyanka is my granddaughter on the show. You. That's I'm that's how we obsessed with you. Yeah, that's how we refer to each other. What's um, the biggest difference I in you? It has to be the self worth, and it has to be like doing things for me and knowing when someone looks at you for your fame versus looks at you because they could see your soul and connect with it. Like mm. there's been so many, many guys that like, you know, see the sparkly smoke and mirrors Priyanka and, and I let, and I've let them in and it's only burned me. And, and with mm. you know, the latest healthy relationship that I'm in, it's, it's, I could tell he liked me from a year ago. He messaged me that this guy, because I was trying to get a tattoo cover up, and he's a tattoo artist. And it was never about, oh, like, tell me secrets about Drag Race. Or it was n- never about, so how'd you start drag? It was just all about, like, me as Mark, as a human being. And I think that it, it's it's knowing and, and, and you have to be w- willing to accept a more vulnerable side of people is what... Is, is the h- hardest thing I've had to do this last couple of months is like, opening my, myself up to somebody. But it's been the healthiest thing because I'm accepting love in the way that I deserve it. I love that. I love that because what that does is it becomes a deal breaker. I mean, whether or not you keep going on with this guy, if you find yourself in another relationship and it doesn't feel right and it doesn't line up with who 100%. you are and what you feel you deserve, it becomes harder and harder to stay in those situations. Because I found myself oh, yeah, ping-ponging totally. back to the old stuff and going, ugh, this is so gross. I can't do this anymore. I'm worth more than this. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah it's self-worth. And it's so it's so hard to find your self-worth. Like, like I've been very lucky to be on this show and be called the trade of the season and have all these opportunities <laughs> where, you know, people are now desiring me and I'm great in drag and great out of drag. So... I just think for those who are listening, who are on the search for their self-worth, it's like be as selfish as you, you can be because only you can fulfill yourself. No, nobody else can do it. Yeah. Wow. We usually okay. ask people to end on a hot message, but I think you just did. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> 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 yeah. I love you so much. Where can people find you on your socials? You can find me at the Queen Priyanka on Instagram, the Queen Priyanka on Twitter. You can find me on TikTok. You can buy my merch online. I have a bunch of music coming out in the spring. I'm Alex's granddaughter. I'm mm-hmm. Matt's babysitter. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> yeah, Booked. you're you're Booked you're solid. so talented. You're so talented, and I'm I'm just I'm so um I'm so glad to be your friend. And I and I was a big fan of you on the show. So to, to for us to uh, start our friendship virtually. And everything, and and to um, well, our rapport was like this immediately. You and I, so I really appreciate yeah. that. Um, we also are both hosts of the official RuPaul's Drag Race podcast, which is released every week. So listen to us on that, Priyanka. We love you. Thank you so much for being on the show. 
Yeah, thank you. Anytime. A show that is called Hot Mess is my kind of show. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, uh, man, that was a really good one. Yeah, that was great. I loved it. Uh, you know what? It's a th- it, the thing is, like, with you, I love watching you be good at stuff. I love watching you kind of um, explain things to me in a way that, like, it's like when I do this podcast with you, there's so many aha moments. Like, you oh, break things down in a way yeah. that I'm kind of like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. That's I like, I like seeing your expertise in action. Oh my God! Thank you, and I love so all that should be a big to it, and also being able to explain things in just kind of basic terms. Sometimes I get caught up in. The I'm a basic bitch, is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, it's kind of no. You're really, you're really good at it, and so you should have an objective confidence about what you do. You're really good at what you do, is what I'm saying. Oh, well, no, when you so when you're feeling insecure, just know that yes. you, because of that, you are making people's lives exponentially better and i'm gonna switch things uh, up and that's gonna be my hot message of the day hot message of the day first of all my first hot message a download and subscribe because we're saving the world one hot mess at a time um but b <laughs> it's really kind of like it, you know when i said that self-worth takes vigilance you really have to zero in on the things that you really genuinely like about yourself what i know is yeah. true about me and even if it's just yes. a little thing, you know, it's kind of like yes. I make people happy. I'm a good friend. Yeah. I'm a good listener. Yeah. Just kind of like and build on that because for years I, I just concentrated on all that crappy stuff. Totally. Yeah, it's really important. Practicing gratitude and affirmations has been a major game changer for me in life. And I'm talking about practice it, like actually sit down mm-hmm. and write these things down every day. Because it's something that just shifts your perspective from scarcity consciousness to abundance consciousness. From Mm -hmm. I'm not enough and my life isn't enough to I'm more than enough and my life is like, you know, overflowing with all the good shit. It changes your perspective in a way that you see things more positively and also can more courageously and non-judgmentally explore the other opportunities for growth within you so that it doesn't keep you complacent in your development in life it actually opens the door in the most motivating and effective way for you to make some of the other changes you want to make knowing that Mm -hmm. you're already starting from solid ground Mm -hmm. because it never ends that's my hot message that's my hot message it never never ends ends. it's ongoing ongoing. okay big boy um where can people find you (laughs) on your socials i love calling you that (laughs) <laughs> you can find me on Instagram at MJ Dempsey Psych and uh, Twitter too, and Matthew J Dempsey Psychotherapy on Facebook. I stutter because I don't think I'm really going to use Facebook and Twitter anymore because I just don't really use it. Really, I'm using Facebook yeah, less and less, but I feel like listen when I go off of Instagram or Facebook, I'll let everybody know. But in the meantime, you yeah. can find me at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter <laughs> at Alec Mappa. You won't find me on TikTok because I quit. Um, uh, you can also um, find us both at Stage Twenty Nine on Twitter. Send us your questions. We love hearing from you. Um, we're so grateful that you tune in week after week. Gratitude, see me leading with gratitude, yes. and. Um, I love it. You know, because without you, there'd be no point in doing this. So thank you for listening and tune in next week for more hot mess fun. Download and subscribe.